Right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to a new week. Uh, I just want to let each one of us know that you know, my eyes are swelling, so I'm going to leave the video off, uh, and then I'll just project the notes. Uh, hope that's okay, uh, because I've got a sweating in both my eyes. So, All right, uh, let's begin this time with a word of prayer. Uh, any one of us can please lead in prayer. Charles? Bakur? Yes, Pastor. Dear Heavenly Father, we praise you. Yeah. Holy name. Praise. Thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity. Holy Spirit, Father, we ask your guidance. We can learn the core of this stuff, Father. And well, then, we according to your holy will and be a good minister, Father. We dedicate Pastor Paul as well our classmates and dear to our place. Thank you, Father. Show your mercy and your wisdom and knowledge. I ask this prayer in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Prabhakar. All right. So we've completed uh, First Corinthians. Right. So we'll get into Second Corinthians. Right. Uh, and again, Second Corinthians has thirteen chapters. Uh, so let's begin with Second Corinthians. Now, a little bit of background. What happened was Paul was in Ephesus, and he wrote First Corinthians from there. And most probably, he sent the letter through Titus. Right now, remember later on, uh, Paul says there's a great door. Remember we did that last week. There's a great door that's open in Ephesus, and uh, you know he he also says like they are like they were like wild beasts after him, uh, meaning there was so much of persecution for the Apostle Paul, but yet he decides to stay back in Ephesus uh, uh, because there was a great door of ministry open there. Right, So he stays in Ephesus, and from Ephesus, Paul went on to Macedonia. Right? Now, Macedonia includes Neopolis, Philippi, Thessalonica, and Berea. Right? Now, while in Macedonia, Paul wrote Second Corinthians. Right Now, again, we know the Macedonian call, right? Uh, Paul gets a dream and a vision, and somebody says, Come over to Macedonia. There's a door open here in, in the dream. Uh, and so Paul goes there, but there was a lot of persecution there. There was a lot of opposition there, right? And uh, it's not like, you know, God, it's wonderful to look at this, right? God opened the door, but the opposition was still there. It was not like, you know, everything was made smooth for the Apostle Paul. Uh, he went through great oppositions even in Macedonia, but he was comforted by the arrival of Titus, right? So uh, Titus comes and he gives them a, a good report, right? He gives Paul a good report. So most probably what would have happened was Titus went, he gave the letter to the Corinth, they read it, they would have changed their hearts. And, and now he's coming back and informing the apostle that you know, things are changing, the church has... Uh, you know, has agreed to uh, you know, follow the instructions that you have read, and so he was greatly comforted by both Titus's arrival and for the response of the church. Right. So now let's get into chapter one. Chapter one, uh, Second Corinthians one, one and two. Uh, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother to the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints who are in all Achaia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Right now, Paul begins his letter with a customary greeting, what he always does. He says, call to be an apostle by the will of God. Uh, and we looked at the word apostle right, uh, many times, apostolos, which means uh, somebody who is sent or a delegate and an ambassador. And then he says, Timothy, our brother. Timothy was part of Paul's team. Now, I have mentioned this many times. He was a young boy, probably about 17 years old. But Paul has come to a place now. He's well matured in ministry. He's, he's, he's finished his second missionary journey. And now he's calling Paul our brother in Christ. Right? So he's honoring the call that is there on Timothy's life. Right? And uh, 
with all the saints who are in Achaia. Achaia is a region of Greece that includes Corinth and St. Crea. Now, if you see, uh, when Paul goes into Athens, from Athens he goes to Corinth, right? But from Corinth, I, uh, there's no mention of St. Crea, but later on we know in Romans 16, uh, talking about a church there, believers in St. Crea also. So, so Paul intended that these letters be read by the believers in the region, not just for the believers in Corinth, but also the region in Achaia and Centria. Right. So uh, what we will do is uh, we'll, we will be going a little quick because this is, there's a lot of repetitions in a second letter. So we'll see what is important and uh, we'll pick up on those points. So, but feel free to stop me if you have any questions or anything you'd like to share. Right, so comfort in suffering. Verses 3 to 7. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in trouble, and with the comfort which we ourselves are comforted by God. Now you see the word comfort is being used so many times, right? The Greek word is paraklesis. Now, the Holy Spirit, uh, parakletos, is the comforter. So he says here, he's using the Greek paraklesis, uh, uh, somebody who, who consoles, who comforts us. Now, Paul praises God the Father, who is the originator of compassion, who is merciful, and he is the one who brings comfort and console to everyone who needs it. Right. Now, remember this, uh, Paul has a team. Right? He says, I've greatly comforted when Titus comes. But again, he's saying, he's trying to you know, make it a point to, for the church to understand that, yes, we are comforted by people around us, by our family, friends. But the greatest comfort is the comfort that we can receive from God. Because he's the originator of comfort. Right. Sometimes, you know, people may comfort us. We may feel all right, but after a couple of weeks or months, uh, we'll go back to how we were feeling. But when God comforts us, there's this assurance, there's this peace, right? There's this feeling of calmness. Uh, and that is way above the comfort that we can receive from us, from, you know, people around us. Now, it does not mean that we don't need people around us it does right for example if somebody has lost a loved one and during the time of bereavement they would it, it is nice for somebody to be there to bring comfort but they can only do it up to a certain limit right? once you know once they go back the person who's lost the loved one is still going to be troubled right uh, so he God Paul is saying God is the comforter the God who comforts us in all tribulation Right, uh, uh, tribulation. The Greek word here is klipsis, which refers to situations that are pressure-filled and oppressing together. Right, we know the word tribulation means trials and challenges, and uh, you know, a, a time of difficulties. And he's saying here, God comforts us in those times of tribulation. Now, Paul is sharing from his personal experience as well, right? So if you look at this previous to this, uh, he was in Ephesus, right? In Ephesus, again, he mentions, right, they were like wild peace. And even from the first missionary journey, from the time the Apostle Paul began his ministry, we see that he was persecuted. And he, he remember the time when uh, they beat him and threw him from the cliff, they thought that he was dead, uh, but he got up and went on. Oh, remember the time in Acts 16, uh, Paul and Silas in, in Philippi in prison, they had beaten him and they chained him. And, uh, and so there are many tribulations that Paul is going through and has gone through, and he's talking from experience, right? Comfort, consolation, and strength is something that God can give them. It's very easy to break during times of tribulations, right? right? Uh, it's very easy to, 
you know ask questions to god god why is this happening or or you know why why am i going through this why am i not seeing a miracle uh, all these things are there but paul is sharing and he's saying god is a god who comforts us through all seasons now he's talking from experience it's not like paul is sitting in the comfort you know in you know in his house comfortable space and writing this letter no he's writing from experience and he says here every trial is an opportunity to receive divine strength and enable enablement from the holy spirit right look at that word it's an opportunity for us right all of us may go through trials challenges but it's an opportunity for us to say god you are my strength you are, you will enable me you will comfort me you will build me you will uh, you know uh, uh, build me up and help me over the season to overcome the season uh, and so paul is writing to the church in corinth uh, remember that the church was also persecuted because they were a small group of people who uh, and in corinth there were there was all you know we talked about the background of corinth uh, sexual immorality there was uh, all kinds of things happening uh, so it was not like the church was enjoying themselves no there was persecutions for them as well so paul is saying be encouraged right so verse 5 for as the sufferings of christ abound in us so our consolation also abounds through christ right he describes the kind of sufferings that he and his ministry team went through for the sake of the gospel and right, look at this in second corinthians 11 later on we look at that he says he was being whipped imprisoned stoned shipwrecked dangers in the sea in the wilderness in the city among false brethren being weary lack of sleep hunger thirst being cold with inadequate clothing now look at this list this is what Paul has gone through. And, and he's saying, God is our comfort. What an amazing, amazing attitude, or what an amazing comfort God is. Right? Imagine all of this happened to him. And I'm sure there were many other things, but he's just listing down a few of them here, right? Uh, being whipped, imprisoned, stoned, shipwrecked, you know, uh, lack of sleep, hunger, thirst. You know, the thing of traveling from one place to another, it, it was not easy. Right? So he's mentioning here the sufferings that he went through for Christ. Uh, again, Romans 8, 35 to 37, Paul lists uh, tribulations. He says, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, and sword, and, and, and declares triumphantly over all of this. He says, in all this, I love this verse, we are more than conquerors. So Paul is confident, right? He's saying the sufferings will come, the sufferings will go. And for the sake of Christ, the sufferings will increase. But where, where the sufferings increase, God's comfort, strength, and empowering will also increase. What a, what a joy that is, right? Uh, when we are going through, many a times, you know, we feel uh, we're going through these problems. Um, but, you know, where is God? He's there he's there he it's just that we have to press on and say god give me the strength so here's the thing sometimes you know we look at those challenges we look at those sufferings those tribulations and we focus on that more than focusing on what god can do right uh you know yesterday uh, we were i was at church and all of a sudden my eyes started burning right and i started to uh, feel very nauseous and uh, and then after church many of them came for prayer uh, but my eyes started becoming red and just started swelling up and uh, you know i finished church just uh, prayed for people went back home and my eyes had all swollen up and i thought to myself you know i, I remember yesterday i was just telling oh man you know i have to do this i have to prepare for the class i have things to do uh, you know uh, uh, regarding the church, I, I got to meet people, uh, so many things to get done. And all of that, I, uh, you know, I, I only focused on what the problem was. But I thank God that, you know, even as we, as I just, you know, looked to God and I said, God, give me the strength to, to go through the season. There was a comfort, right? 
uh, it's not easy. I can hardly open my eyes right now. I can hardly read. Uh, but God is our comfort. God is our strength, right? And we take consolation in that. Right? He gives us the grace. Let's look at verse 6 and 7. Now, if we are afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effective for the enduring and for enduring the same sufferings which we also suffer. Right? Or, or if we are comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope for you is steadfast, because we know that you are partakers of the sufferings. So also, you will partake of the consolation. Right? It's so wonderful. The sufferings that Paul endured uh, for the sake of the gospel has resulted in great fruit for the kingdom of God. Right? Now, it was not like, Apostle Paul is suffering and suffering and suffering, and there's no result. No, he's seeing the fruit, right? And the and you know because he's seeing the fruit, there's a consolation, right? There is. Imagine this. Paul starts off on his first missionary journey. He goes into Galatia. He goes into these churches. He plants churches. But what happens in the first missionary journey? They persecuted him. They beat him. He went through all those turmoils, but he is seeing with his own eyes the fruit that has been that of the gospel, the fruit of his of his afflictions, of his troubles. Right? Um, and here he's saying he was strengthened to endure sufferings for the sake of the gospel. Right? He's seeing the fruit. So it was like Paul is saying, okay, there's going to be troubles, but I see fruit. I see churches being planted. I see people giving lives, giving their lives to Christ. I see God is working. Now, uh, so we will we will take consolation that, right? We, are, uh, we will take consolation that God is working, using us. But also, we will take comfort that God will give us the grace through these trials and difficulties, right? So very important. Something that we can always learn is you know during these challenging times, see the fruit. See what God has done probably in the past. Look at how He will He you know brought healing or brought deliverance or how He was there for you. Uh, he 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 you know uh, miraculously made a way. Uh, look at those times and find consolation. And that's what Paul is doing. Difficult times. He is He is probably looking at the fruit and he's saying, "No, oh, this is if we did this through the sufferings, but God was faithful to you know." work in their lives verse 8 to 11 for we do not know sorry we do not want you to be ignorant brethren of our trouble which came to us in asia that we are burdened beyond measure above strength so that we despaired even of life yes we had a set had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust ourselves but in god who raised the dead who delivered us from so great a death and does deliver us in whom we trust that he will still deliver us. You also helping together in prayer for us that thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the gift granted to us through many. Right? So Paul is saying, listen, uh, we want you to know some of the challenges that we've gone through. Right? It's not like Paul is saying, uh, see, uh, you know, he's he's not boasting of those uh you know troubles that i went through but he's he's saying he's saying i went through underwent these trials and tribulations uh which burdened and weighed them down so so they were able to you know overcome all of this he's listed down there right fighting with wild beasts in ephesus 39 stripes after being brought before the jewish court right those lashes were really uh, you know, painful ones. The riot in Ephesus, where they, you know, they caught him, they beat him up, uh, and somehow they asked him. You know, they Paul escaped from there. The persecution uh, shortly before Paul left for Troas. Uh, now these are just few of them. Paul had seen many, many, many persecutions, right? But Paul is saying here, he trusts God who delivered them, and he continues to deliver as he has promised in the past. He will promise, he will do it even today. He is the deliverer. He's the unchanging God. He's the same yesterday, today, and in the future as well. 
this is an important and powerful truth about the nature of God. Right? You and I can hold on to this promise. God, you have delivered me before. You have, deliver, uh, you, have, you have restored me before. You can do it now as well. Because God is the God who is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. So he's unchanging. If there are seasons we're going through, we can look to him. We can look to him and say, God, you've done it in the past. Do it again, my life. Right? And God is willing to do it. Paul is uh, stating the importance here of intercessory prayer by the church uh, for those in ministry. Right? Uh, and Paul knew and acknowledged that the release of the gifts for effective ministry is from God, and it's the answer of faithful prayers of the believers. Right? So he's saying, it's important that we know that there will be trials, there will be challenges, but it's important to have people pray. There's intercessory prayer that has happened. And we see all through the scriptures, of, especially the life of Apostle Paul, uh, he, many a times, he has focused on the importance of prayer, right? Even before going to uh, King Agrippa, he, he says, I bow my knee to the Father, which means I don't bow my knee to anybody else. I bow my knee to the Father to, and I pray for each one of you. And he again says that the burden for each of the churches that is there in him, he says, I pray for each one of you every, every day, right? So intercessory prayer is very important for those in ministry and for those who are believers, part of a church. Uh, it's very important to pray for your leaders, for the pastors, for the for your for the believers within the church as well. I think there's a question. Yes, Christopher, go ahead, please. Yeah, Christopher, do you have a question? Oh, uh, yes, uh, Pastor, uh, thank yes. you. Yes. Uh, my question is with uh, intercessory prayer. Um, mm. uh, is it possible to, um, uh, you know, besides asking our, uh, you know, our, um, uh, you know, asking someone who is, uh, you know, who's, who's here on the earth, uh, you know, someone who's an elder or, a, you know, a, a pastor or you know yes. a close one um there are uh, you know um, denominations where they they pray to um, people who have passed on and people who have who are believers so um as well as um, you know it's, it's for example in the catholic church they, they you know they pray to uh, to mary to to intercede for them so I just wanted to understand what your comment on that would be. Yeah, sure. So I would respond to this with one simple verse. It is 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. And it says, And God wills that all should come to the knowledge of the truth as it is in Jesus, because Jesus Christ is the one mediator between God and man. Right? All should come to the knowledge of the truth because Jesus is the one mediator between God and man. So, Christopher, to answer your question, yes, there are, uh, you know, as you mentioned, the Catholic Church that uh, believe even in purgatory. Uh, they believe in, uh, I think it is All Souls Day. I'm not sure what that day is, but uh, uh, they pray to those who have uh, passed on. Now, it is not biblical, right? Because one, there is one mediator between God and man. Two, uh, Paul also writes that he says, to be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord. Right? So if we are you know, praying to a soul that is already passed, they, it, they cannot do anything. Right? It, they are powerless. I mean, uh, they may be the greatest you know, uh, evangelists or pastors, but they cannot really do anything because God says there is one mediator between God and man. Nobody else. Nobody else can take that place. And so that that I think that verse itself, Christopher, speaks for itself. Uh, one mediator between God and man. 
and he goes on to say the man Jesus Christ. So, uh, so it's wonderful to see that you know Paul is writing the man Jesus Christ because it's the man Jesus Christ who can relate to us. I have used this example many times, right? So, uh, we are going through troubles, or for example, we are going through a time of fasting. Now, the God the Father doesn't know what it feels like, right? Uh, right? He 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 does understand us, but he hasn't gone through that because we know he's God the Father, right? But Jesus, being our intercessor, being our mediator, he knows what it is. Right? He knows what it is to stay without food. He knows what it is to uh, you know, have pains in the body. Uh, so the man Jesus Christ relating to uh, both his God, his man as well. Uh, so Christopher, I would say that it is it is wrong and it is not biblical and it should not be done. All right, so I just, just to confirm, uh, I mean the the I mean I guess the argument from mm. from these people is that if we can ask um, you know if I if I were to ask you to pray for you know pray for me, um, I'm I'm still going in a sense through you as an as a as an as an intercessory. Uh, so what they are saying is that um, can they go can they go to I mean I think Mother Mary is what is the one that they keep you know they do keep uh, you know. Uh, um, mentioning, uh, so they feel that you know, in the same way they can they can get um, uh, Mother Mary to to intercede for them. Yeah. So the thing is, uh, Christopher, it is not biblical because see, Paul writes to the Ephesians. He says, he says to the Ephesians, uh, uh, especially he says to them, you know, uh, pray for each other, uh, pray for your leaders. So praying for each other, that is okay. But I'm praying for somebody who has already passed away and gone. Uh, I mean, uh, see, if I, for example, I have a prayer request, right? I'm coming to you and I'm saying, hey, Christopher, you know what? Uh, this is what I'm going through. Uh, can you pray for me? Now, Paul says the prayer of, uh, I think it's in Matthew, uh, the prayer of faith will heal the believer, right? So now, uh now i am praying with somebody right but i'm not praying to somebody uh that who's already passed on who's 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 dead right and the bible says that you know, i understand where you're coming from uh you know I, I, your question is you know i'm asking you to pray so why not i ask somebody who's you know, for example mother mary or a, a, a great saint who has passed on why can't i ask them to pray right so the thing is, the, the, when we when I'm praying with somebody who's a brother or a sister in Christ, right? We are praying with understanding. We are praying for each other, right? But here it is, it's more of a one-way prayer, and it's uh, I would say it's not biblical first of all. Uh, but again, over the years, these ideas and thoughts have come into the. Uh, you know, the Roman Catholic Church, especially, so uh, it they, it's still carried on. But I would say, uh, if somebody asked me, I would say that you know I wouldn't do it because there's one mediator uh, between God and man. So I'm not praying to the person when I'm praying with somebody. I'm praying with the person, right? So somebody's praying for me for my prayer request. I'm praying with him, but I'm not praying to him. I'm not saying, okay, I hope this uh, this guy, this person I'm praying with uh, is able to heal my sickness. No, I'm praying with him to the Lord Jesus. Here, I'm praying to the soul, uh, which is wrong. Oh, so, so I hope that uh, I may, may not be very, if I'm not very clear, maybe we can, uh, you know, I can just uh, get some more thoughts and share with you later on as well. So, uh, so I think that, that's something we must remember this uh, first. So I'm praying with somebody or I'm praying to somebody. Okay, say he has lifted his hands, raised his hands. Yes, say. Yes, Pastor. Um, not, to, not to be too vocal, but just mm -hmm. to support your comment is that 
Um, I think this takes us back to church history, which you took us last year. Sorry, this year rather. Was it last year or this year? I can't remember. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I, I know we discussed basically that there were a lot of um, pagan worship practices yes. that were, you know, adopted into the Catholic Church. Yeah. And um, one of it is what has been mentioned by Brother Christopher. And so we, we just have to be very careful to understand that if there's nothing, if there's any practice that is done by any faith and it's not, in, it's not consistent with scripture, I think we should just discard it because the practice of praying to Mary or to the saints was something they adopted from the pagan practices they were, they were into before Christianity was institutionalized in Roman, in Rome at that time. So, but we must be consistent with scripture, just like you pointed out, you know, we only have one person in whom we pray in and to and true, and that's Jesus Christ. Uh, no, none of, any, none of the saints who have gone, even the apostles, even the Mary, none of them have any power, you know, to carry on our prayers to God. The only person we have been uh, told to pray to or, you know, um, it's Jesus Christ, basically. So I think we should just put that into context and put that in mind that many things that are done in the Catholic Church today is as a result of the pagan worship then. And it's to interest us that there's actually a segment of the Catholic Church called the Charismatic Catholic Church who have identified some of all these practices and they have stopped all those things, though they still regard themselves part of the Catholic Church, but there are a number of things they have discarded, and one of it is this, right? So we must be consistent with Scripture. I think that's a summary, basically. Thank yes. you, Pastor. Yes, thank you so much, Say Yes, being consistent with Scripture. And also, uh, I think another thing is, you know, in the Book of Acts, uh, I, you know, I have had a lot of discussions with people from Catholic faith, and they asked me this question, why, is it, why do you say it's wrong? Uh, and my answer was very simple uh, because, see, in the book of Acts, firstly, uh, they say they call her the Virgin Mary, and we know that she's not a virgin. Uh, she did have other children after that. So that debunks the whole Virgin Mary thing. And then two is when the 120 were praying for the Holy Spirit, she was there. Right Now, we do honor her. We do respect her, but we don't worship her. And we don't pray to her because she herself was there praying for the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So, so there's so many things that uh, you know when we think about these, uh, you know, it, uh, we just know that you know God has decided that there will be one mediator, and uh, you know that mediator is going to be Jesus. Uh, Rupa, you have lift, raised your hands as well. Yes, sir. Just while it's, we were, you were discussing with. Brother Christopher, suddenly a verse popped up in my mind. I just wanted to share Revelation 14, 13. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth, saith the Lord, that they may rest from the, their labors and their works do follow them. After a person dies, even if he is a saint, his works is rested. He's resting in the Lord. He is no more uh, interceding for anyone. That is what I got from that verse. Sir. I just wanted yes. to share. Thank you so much, Rupa. Yes. Rest. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes. Uh, Christopher, I hope that helps. Uh, Rose has also commented here, praying for the praying for help from the dead. Uh, falls on divination. Yes. Yes, it does. Uh, remember, in the Old Testament, uh, uh, the witch at Endor, I forget the chapter, but uh, the witch, Saul goes to the witch of Endor and says, bring up Samuel so that he can tell me what I must do. And, uh, you know, so Samuel, the witch was able to bring a person, but we know that it was not Samuel. Uh, so it's divination. It is, uh, it is not something that, uh, you know, it, as, as Rose has mentioned, it's an abomination. In the eyes of God, so, uh, but again, it's God's grace. See, it's it's the lack of understanding. You see how the enemy is a deceiver. He's able to bring in things that can just you know uh, divert people from the truth. That's all he wants to do, right? Uh, 
he just wants to go a little astray, right? So something that is truth, if you go a little away from it, it becomes false. But most of it may be true, but yet it, it still remains false because we've gone away from it. So the enemy is, you know, he works in that way. So we as believers must be very careful on, uh, you know, on what we, let the word of God be our basis. Uh, that is the standard on which we, uh, you know, on which we should stand. Right. Thank you, Charles, for saying it's not godly to ask help from the dead. Even praying for them is idolatry. Yes. All right. So let's continue from where we stop. Okay. So verse 12 onwards, Paul is mentioning about no hidden motives or actions. Verse 12. For our boasting is this, the testimony of our conscience that we conducted ourselves in the world in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God and more abundantly towards you. Paul's conscience was clear, right? He, he conducted himself in sincerity, in honesty, in integrity, without pretense, without hypocrisy. So he was clear. He, he didn't have to hide anything. He didn't have to portray himself as somebody else. He was clear. His conscience was clear. He knew uh, that everything that he did was for the benefit, is what God called him to do, and also for the benefit of the church. And, and, and so he there was no pretense. There was no hypocrisy. right? For we are not writing any other thing to you than what you read or understand. Now I trust you will understand even to the end. There is no self-seeking here. Uh, Paul is saying, as ministers, we must follow a good example. Live life with a clear conscience, simplicity and sincerity. And I think some of uh, these two are very important. There's power in simplicity and there's power in sincerity. Right? Uh, humility also. Right? It's powerful. Uh, and as leaders, you see, you see, Apostle Paul, he was a humble man, yet he brought correction in the right way. He was sincere, yet he, you know, he was sincere for the church and the things that are happening. He was a simple man, right? Uh, you know, Paul does not mention about his, you know, his great uh, achievements. There was only one time when he was talking about himself. Uh, he was saying all these things I was, but all of this I counted rubbish uh, in the sight of God. So he was he was actually a great man, studied under Gamaliel, the commander of the temple guard, uh, Pharisee of the Pharisees. Uh, but you see that there was some kind of a simplicity in him. He never used those credentials as a way of you know manipulating people or trying to you know, uh, rule or boss over people. He never did that. Right? He, he explains that, uh, he always says that, I did ministry with a clear conscience, simplicity, and sincerity. Right? Verse 15 and 16. And in this confidence, I intended to come to you before that you might have a second benefit to pass by the way by way of you to Macedonia, to come again from Macedonia to you and be helped by you on my way to Judea. Therefore, when I was planning this, did I do it lightly? Or the things I plan, do I plan according to the flesh? That would mean there, would mean there should be yes, yes and no. But as God is faithful, our word to you was not yes and no. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, by me, Salvinus and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him was yes. Right. So now Paul is writing to the church and he's mentioning a bit of changes in his travel plans. Right. He's saying, I would love to visit you at Corinth when I'm returning from Macedonia. And then he says, Paul changed his mind and visited so he's here in Ephesus. He has to go to Macedonia. And now it says that on the way, probably Paul changed his mind. And he said, okay, before I go to Macedonia, let me go visit Corinth. Right? 
Now the visit, this visit was difficult one for both Paul and the Corinthian church because now remember the first letter, Paul was stern. He was he he had to confront people. Remember he also said, uh, hand them over to the devil, meaning just take them out of the church. Now on this, you know, after saying all this in this first letter, Paul had to go and uh, he wanted to still meet them. Now this visit was unpleasant and didn't seem much beneficial. Paul did not visit Corinth while returning from Macedonia, but wrote to them a severe letter instead. Right? So we see that on the way to Macedonia, he visits Corinth. But while coming back from Macedonia, he says, no, I will not visit Corinth. Right? But instead of visiting them, I will write a letter. Right? And, and that's when he wrote uh, Second Corinthians. Right? So Paul declares with utmost confidence that even as God's nature is faithfulness, God does not say yes when he wants to say no and vice versa. Right? So in the same manner, his words were also true. Uh, and so basically what Paul is saying is whatever I do is not led by the flesh, but what I do is led by the spirit. The decision that I made to change my travel plans and come to you before going into Macedonia was God's leading. Now, while returning from Macedonia, I'm going to I'm not going to visit you because when I visited you, there was it was not a pleasant visit. It was not beneficial. Maybe some of them were still upset with Paul's letter. Remember the first few chapters of First Corinthians? That was really stern. He says uh, he starts. You know, he's so upset with the church. Maybe some of them are still upset with him, or uh, you know, they didn't, uh, uh, you know, they didn't accept him the way that he wanted, or probably the uh, the the whole visit was not beneficial at all. So he says, "Okay, I will write a letter to them." Right? For the promises of God in Him are yes, and to Him, and in Him, Amen, to the glory of God through us. In Christ's promises for each of us. Right. I'm sure we've all gone through the book, Who We Are in Christ. As believers, we have a, a whole list of promises that God is giving us because we are in Christ. Right. Look at this verse, 1 Corinthians 6, 17. He says, but he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. You are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8, 1. Therefore, there is no condemnation for you for those who are in Christ Jesus, right? So as believers, we are in Christ, right? Uh, Colossians, again, he talks about being in Christ. So plenty of places, Paul writes about being in Christ. All of us have been promised by the Father that when we are in Christ, Jesus is assured us a yes and an amen. In Christ promises are ours. Right? So, and we've learned this in who we are in Christ, right? Uh, we, it is just imputed into us. The moment we become believers, we believe in the Lord Jesus, the work that he did on the cross, and we accept him as our personal savior. All the promises that are in Christ is imputed, which means it's just poured out into us. God is not going to say, okay, have you prayed one hour a day? Have you done this? Have you done that? You know, have you read your Bible? No. He has imputed all those gifts or the, the promises into us. We are saved, we are healed, we are delivered, redeemed. Uh, we are the child of God, we are the heir of Christ, we are co-heirs with him. And those wonderful, wonderful uh, promises, it all is for us because we are in Christ. Verse 21 and 22. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us in God, who has sealed us and given us the spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. God does these for the disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are established in him. What is the word established? It means to make firm or to make sure. We are established. So no matter what the devil comes and says, no, you are like this, you are like that. We must be established in him. 
we may not feel established but we are established two we are anointed by the holy spirit so christ has anointed us in god right and the greek word anointed here is creo which is to rub oil or to smear to concentrate for holy use so god has anointed us he has empowered us he has filled us separated us for his service so he has anointed us by the holy spirit we are sealed right so sealed by the holy spirit and paul says right uh, in many places we are uh, i bear in my body the marks of the lord jesus we are sealed by the holy spirit do not grieve the holy spirit with whom you have been who is a guarantor of our soul and and so he has purchased possession he has sealed us he's saying we are his and the holy spirit is our guarantee a down payment uh, as a pledge that the full redemption will be made in the future holy spirit is our guarantee a down payment for us finally the last two verses moreover i call god as witness against my soul that i spare you i came no more to corinth not that i would not that we have dominion over your faith but our fellow workers for your joy for by faith you stand and so again paul is stating out of concern the corinthian believers that he did not visit them as planned since he did not want them to be even more sorrowful and you, you see the heart of paul here he, you, you see the heart of a father the, the heart of a loving father and you know the when you read first corinthians it looks like why is he so angry no, but it's just the love of god right that he you know he's saying you know this this sentence itself is so touching right it, it, look at the church when you picture it the church in corinth are there they are a small group of people just trying to live a holy life they're finding it difficult there are so many challenges paul is correcting them uh, some of them are taking it some of them are upset some of them are sad so paul is saying i didn't want to come to you because if, if i see you uh you will be more sorrowful and i also will be more sorrowful so that's why i will write a letter to you right but paul is saying that there's a responsibility that i have i'd be called as an apostle he's has this responsibility uh, with the believers so he did not boss over them and he did not dominate their faith but he was only doing what he was doing out of love but he was correcting them sternly uh but he did it out of love Right? he did not want them to lose faith in god he did not want them to just walk away from the things of god and we see that apostle paul had that heart and uh, it is you know it's very sad when you think of this right the, the church would, would be sorrowful and even paul would be sorrowful maybe he felt you know that first visit that he came maybe he saw that you know they they were sad or they were upset or uh, and that he got upset or sad for this and uh but his main aim was to build the believers up to get them to do the right things right and it is by their own individual faith that each corinthian believers stood for christ and lived their life right was when he was wonderful not not that we have dominion over your faith but we are fellow workers for joy for by faith you stand So Paul is saying, I may be an apostle, I may be the one who came and started the church, but I'm not overpowering you. I'm not having dominion over you. I'm not saying I. You have to listen to me. Uh, of course, in the first, in First Corinthians, he says, he talks about the right of an apostle, and, and you know, he's saying this is what I am. This is what I did. But he's saying this not to dominate over them, but to just tell them, you know, we are fellow workers in Christ, and together. Uh, uh oh, we we can see the joy of the lord uh because it is by faith itself that we can stand and he brings this first chapter to a close uh all right let's take a break we'll come back and uh we'll begin with chapter 2 10 minutes break okay.